All right, this is our recording for our second class on August uh, 29th. Um, and so here we're focusing on chapters three and four from uh, Brand and Chadwick's book. And uh, we need to explore this question, how should we understand science? And as we, 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 we talk about this, I'm talking about how do we understand science in its context, in its historical context, and in its philosophical context. So first, let's talk about the historical context of science. So while um, y- you know it's 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 been in the you know past two three hundred years uh, where people have really developed some sophisticated tools uh, for being able to see aspects of the creation that nobody had ever seen before. Uh, so while that's only been happening for the last two three hundred years, people have been studying the creation in a very sophisticated and in a very robust and and organized way uh, for uh, is seemingly about as long as as mankind has has been alive which shouldn't come as any surprise um, y- you know if if what the Bible teaches about origins is correct and and man had his beginning uh, in a relationship with God and was called to have dominion over God's creation, um, it, it would only make sense that that from the beginning man has been seeking to better understand uh, this creation. And so as we look in uh, early Mesopotamian uh, cultures, which some of the earliest historical information that we have, we see uh, attempts uh, to really uh, get to understand this world that we live in. And, and um, the Babylonian and Egyptians, these and Babylonian and other Mesopotamian societies, um, really lay some some nice foundational work for the Greek philosophers and scientists uh, that come after them, and so uh, the 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 Greeks actually studied a, a great deal. They're probably most famous for their f- philosophical works, um, but uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Aristarchus, uh, Archimedes. Um, had just did some phenomenal work. Uh, Euclid uh, in in geometry did some incredible work in advancing our understanding of of this creation. Now, uh, as Greek uh, society was um, usurped by Roman rule, the Romans held on to some of that for a while. But as Rome started to fall and uh, the Germanic tribes. Um, took over, you, you, you get a loss of scientific inquiry in, in Europe. Um, but you can see from this arm of the tree that scientific inquiry continues uh, in China and later in the Arabic countries. And then by the time Europe um, starts to come out of what we call the Dark Ages, you find not only a, a discovery of what's been going on in these Arab uh, Arabic countries, um, that had adopted some of the work from Chinese uh, science, but also rediscovery of the Greek science. And that's a very important point uh, in understanding the context of science is understanding this point here, this rediscovery of Greek science. And it wasn't just a rediscovery of Greek science that happened then. It was also a rediscovery of, of Greek philosophy, especially of uh, Aristotelian philosophy. And a lot of... Um, what was understood uh, in science was was heavily shaped uh, by Greek philosophy and, and Greek science, um, poising Europe in many ways uh, for a uh, a scientific revolution uh, that happened along with the Enlightenment. So keep that in mind. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But I want to focus in on some of this Greek science. So as as mentioned previously, not only were the Greeks uh, incredibly interested in philosophy. Uh, Aristotle and, and and other Greek philosophers explored the natural world a great deal. Uh, Aristotle wrote in the areas of biology and cosmology and geology, and uh, so here's uh, Aristotle Arist, Aristotle Aristotle's idea of cosmology. Uh, you see, this is a um, a, a Earth uh, centered, uh, a geocentric view of uh of the universe which is 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 clearly wrong however uh, as we talked in our previous lecture um good theories can still be wrong and so aristotle's writings heavily influenced ptolemy uh who um 
cemented kind of this idea of uh, a Greek idea of, of uh, how the universe was structured. And so uh, this in many ways, as, as Europe rediscovers these Greek philosophies and these Greek scientific um, theories, it really kind of poises uh, and, and, and makes um, kind of the relationship between Galileo and Copernicus and Kepler and the church at the time very uncomfortable because the church in many ways uh, adopted Aristotelian philosophy and also Aristotelian uh, scientific theories uh, and, and in many ways interpreted scripture in light of those theories, um, creating kind of an awkward uh, position when uh, people started to propose a, uh, a heliocentric uh, universe. And so, yeah, just kind of running down some some major uh, scientific um, discoveries uh, uh, throughout the history of science. I wanted to address this question, how did they know? Uh, as we look through here, uh, there are some people, Aristarchus, probably the greatest example of this, proposing a heliocentric universe in, in 300 BC. Uh, he was roughly a, a contemporary of Aristotle, a little bit after Aristotle, but not nearly as um, widespread or as popular. And so uh, Ptolemy, uh, cementing Aristotle's views, um, basically cemented a geocentric uh, universe uh, idea in, in Greek scientific theory. But Aristarchus, a uh, great time ago, um, uh, what, what are we looking at, about 2,300 years ago, uh, proposed a heliocentric universe and that the Earth actually revolved around the Sun. Uh, Aresmi in the in the 1300s uh, proposed that the Earth spins on its axis, uh, in other words, that it rotates on an axis, uh, but then said that the Bible refuted this idea, and it wasn't necessary. I mean, it obviously wasn't something pulled directly from uh, Scripture, but rather the position of the Church uh, that. Uh, refuted this claim. So then you you get, again, like I mentioned, this kind of awkward position between the church and these scientists, Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler, that were really uh, presenting a great deal of evidence for a heliocentric universe, a heliocentric um, solar system. And uh, because of um, the position of the church uh, adopting that Greek scientific theory, uh, it was it was a really a really tough relationship. So another thing that the church had um, absorbed from Greek scientific theories was was a static universe, not a non-moving, because obviously they, they had seen how the stars move in the night sky, um, but static and, and unchanging, that they were basically um, these celestial bodies that were perfect, uh, that were separate from this world and were perfect and moved, but they, in other ways, were static. And they believe this about living organisms as well, this idea of fixity of species, that the animals that we have now have not changed in any way uh, since the beginning of this world. That's going to be an important piece uh, to keep in mind as we move uh, a little bit later in this lecture. So some others, um, this, this idea of spontaneous generation, that life just uh, results from dirty rags or from a uh, liquid broth uh, with 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 food in it or uh, scraps of food. Um, this idea was well cemented but refuted by work from Reddy Spallanzani, who we've seen before with his work in bats, and of course Louis Pasteur uh, in his work with showing that bacteria and other microbes don't just spontaneously. Um, come to exist, uh, that they, that they actually have to, um, spread from, from other places. So it's just some incredible, um, points in the history of science where people with very crude instruments, uh, were able to do some pretty incredible work, uh, advancing science. And we have to think about present science in the context of this. A little bit more about, uh, the, the context of, of science, um, is this question of where did evolution by natural selection come from? Because it, um, Charles Darwin was not the first uh, proponent of this. Um, 
there, there was really a, a progression of work. And in fact, if you study some of uh, some early Greek philosophy, not Aristotle, you get this idea of, of uh, the eternality of matter and, and this kind of generation of life and this fluidity, dynamic nature of life. Um, but really, as we focus in on on Charles Darwin kind of cementing all of these ideas, I want to walk you through a progression. Um, so first thing is is really a, a societal or cultural uh, phenomenon, and that's people were becoming disillusioned uh, with the authoritarian church uh, and state. In many places in Europe, the church and the state were one and the same. And anything deemed heretical was enough to get you banished or even killed. Uh, for those belief and, and people were starting to become disillusioned with this and there was a desire to really answer things apart from a, a creator. Um, so Boyle, Newton and Ray, these were all Christian uh, men, uh, but at uh, kind of predating this um, uh, this this event of uh, explaining all of uh, the universe and all of life uh, from naturalistic pur- purposes, um, they started to provide natural explanations for many phenomena. Uh, at this time, there was uh, people were very superstitious, and and there was a um, supernatural answer for many things that that actually have a very reasonable natural explanation. And so Boyle, Newton, and Ray, believing that God created this universe and created it in an ordered fashion that man could learn to understand it in order to better steward it, really started to provide a lot of natural explanations. And Newton. Uh, being especially wise, um, saw that the potential for this was for people to then uh, claim that the universe, not only do these um, occurrences happen with natural explanations, but maybe even the origin of the universe could be explained with entirely natural processes. And he cautioned against this a great deal. So uh, from this, uh, from the work of these men and this kind of disillusionment with the church and the state, you get what's called methodological naturalism. Uh, This idea that only what is material, only what it can be seen or heard or tasted or felt or um, smelled uh, can be used to explain any natural process. That's this idea of methodological naturalism. And then so right about this time, people started to discover craters in the moon and sunspots on the sun and imperfections in stars. And they start to realize that these celestial bodies are not perfect uh, in the way that they thought they were. And uh, so from this, you get a naturalistic cosmology. You get uh, an explanation of the origins of the universe and the sustaining of the universe with entirely naturalistic processes. In, in other words, applying methodological naturalism uh, to the, the universe as a whole. Uh, Hutton, uh, James, uh, James Hutton, um, sells this idea of, of methodological naturalism in, 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 in geology uh, using a un- uniformitarian uh, thinking. And this idea is based on what's called actualism, uh, where you can only, again, use uh, things that you can actually watch happen to explain any process. And so, therefore, what produced all of the geological features that we see on the Earth must be the processes that we see at work now at the same rate and in the same fashion that we see them now, uh, that there's no uh, variation in those processes in the magnitude uh, or uh, the rate. And so um, Charles Lyell uh, was a much better communicator than James Hutton and really popularized this idea of uniformitarian geology and took it to a point where he explained um, all, all geological features uh, using uniformitarian thinking. So from there, uh, we get uh, a few men, uh, De Buffon, Wells, Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles Darwin, and Lamarck, all basically noting changes in animal form. Uh, and remember what I mentioned previously, the church at this point, uh, for the most part, had adopted the Greek scientific theory that life was static, that the living forms that we have now don't change. 
and uh, but they noted a, a great deal of changes in animal form, and they attempted to explain the origins of life and the dy- dynamic nature of life using methodological naturalism. Now, this received a, a great deal of pushback, not just from the church, but also from the scientific community. And so you get kind of this very interesting um, uh, issue or this very interesting conflict coming up. So Malthus uh, wrote, uh, he was a economist, uh, wrote a, uh, a book basically about demographics and uh, the economy of man. And uh, he wrote that there are more humans being born than can possibly survive. And, and this in many ways shaped Charles Darwin's ideas on natural selection, that uh, if more individuals are born than can possibly survive, th- only certain individuals are going to survive. And the question is, what are those individuals? And so even before he proposed or kind of not proposed, but cemented all of these different ideas on applying methodological naturalism to living forms and proposing evolution by natural selection, universal common descent, Charles Darwin uh, early in his life had, had come to believe that the Bible was unreliable in telling the history of this world and telling the history of the universe and in telling the history of the origins of life. And then, so he goes on his uh, very famous uh, trip on the Beagle as uh, the the assistant of the captain. And uh, when, he, when he comes back after uh, a few decades of, of establishing himself in the scientific community, uh, he argues for evolution by natural selection. But what's interesting is he uses very little um, empirical evidence for it, which I guess in some ways makes sense because it's a very historical um, area within science in which you, you can't really recreate the events. But, but emphasizes on, in his book on the origin of species this, this subjective reasoning uh, behind explaining all of the variation of life using universal common descent through evolution uh, by natural selection. And so the question of where did this come from, it didn't. It obviously didn't originate with Charles Darwin. And in many ways, Europe was poised uh, for this to happen. And and you can even see that with um, the what, what really got Charles Darwin to publish his book when he did is uh, Alfred w- Russell Wallace, um, was, was, had come up with the same idea and was getting ready to publish a complete, um, treatise or a complete description of life originating, uh, this way as well. So we need to deal with some questions of, of how is Darwin wrong? And some of these he pointed out himself. He went to great lengths to explaining why the fossil record, uh, doesn't match, uh, his, his proposed ideas of the origins of life, but in many other ways he was wrong, which just makes, uh, this 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 theory of evolution by natural selection uh, very interesting. So uh, Darwin uh, was a uh, a nationalist, thought very highly of uh, of of Great Britain, of England, and he thought very highly of uh, Western Europe in in general and of white people. And uh, so his ideas uh, were that um, humans evolved from apes, uh, evolved from an organism that would have been classified as an ape, and that some groups of humans uh, were much more closely related uh, to apes than others. Specifically, he wrote about uh, those descending from Africa. He wrote a great deal about aboriginal uh, peoples from around the globe, and that uh, they were less evolved, if you will, uh, than, than white people from Western Europe. Uh, this was clearly wrong. Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, in, in his ideas, had come to a lot of the same conclusions that Charles Darwin did, save uh, with regard to human intelligence. Uh, he spent a great deal of time with Aboriginal groups uh, throughout uh, Southeastern Asia and Oceania, and uh, he understood that they were incredibly intelligent, and he questioned why would uh, the human brain be so much more sophisticated than what was necessary for survival. And so he actually argued uh, that this was evidence of a designer, that uh, that humans in some way were unique and separate from the rest of creation in uh, their abilities to understand uh, this creation.
He was also very wrong about molecular biology. And this wasn't just Charles Darwin, but this was the scientific community at the time believed that a cell was nothing more than just a protoplasmic blob with a nucleus and then virtually nothing inside that that cells were incredibly simple uh, and therefore it was easy to reason that life could have originated from non-life uh, incredibly wrong about this uh, many people propose uh, and you'll even see this written in the brand and chadwick uh, text that had darwin's uh evolution by natural selection been proposed following this kind of revolution in our understanding of molecular and cellular biology that it probably would not have been accepted because of how complex uh, these these cells are and he was also very wrong about genetics again this was not darwin alone although uh, he sh he sh should experience part of the blame but really most of the scientific community uh, Mendel was a contemporary of Darwin, even though we, we they really didn't discover Mendel's work until the uh, early 1900s, at least the significance of Mendel's work. Um, but they didn't understand how genetics work. There was this idea that every cell in your body shed little gimules, little particles, and that uh, those particles would go and accumulate in your gonads and then during copulation some of your particles would combine with some of the particles of your mate of your partner and would combine to form this kind of a blended uh, inheritance and there weren't these discrete characters like what we know function uh, dis uh, specific alleles of genes but they had a very um, basic understanding of genetics and uh, so in many ways, it made it easy to uh, think how these groups of organisms can change very rapidly, whereas uh, it, it, there are some complicating factors of that in the area of population biology, which we'll talk about in the coming lectures. So how is he wrong? He was wrong in many ways. Uh, and, and I think that's important to, to, to point out. Now, we have what's called neo-Darwinian thinking, which is basically a, a fusion of Darwin's proposal of evolution by natural selection and Mendelian genetics and inheritance. And, um, you know, you can, you can um, argue, uh, I think, fairly effectively that the complexity of a, of a cell, even in what would be considered a very simple form of life, like a bacterium, uh, is enough to uh, indicate that life could not originate from non-life. Uh, however, there are uh, you know, several pieces of, of evidence suggesting that, that all living organisms do actually share a single ancestor because of how similar, uh, all of these, um, life forms are. And we'll, we'll address this issue, uh, in the coming lectures, I think obviously is, uh, against a, a biblical position of origins. And I think, you know, fails to explain a lot of the phenomena. So as we, as we continue to ex talk about the history of science, we have to also mention uh, scientists called the interventionists uh, that, that really uh, stand their ground uh, against uh, Darwinian thinking. Here's the problem. So, so when Darwin proposed uh, evolution by natural selection as an explanation for the diversity of life and really all life forms uh, in, in general, it wasn't widely accepted. It, it, it really took several years and even decades for it to become accepted. But at this time, there was a pushback for it from a number of scientists, uh, many of whom uh, believed that uh, life was created unique from, from non-life by God and for a purpose. But, but nobody really put together a, uh, a, a proposal or a theory for for how to explain all of these shared features among living organisms and so uh, because there was no alternative it basically became uh, as as evidence started to accumulate of the similarity among living forms uh, we just I mean Darwinian thinking just just took over uh, several decades later, you get the rise of what you call interventionists that uh, believe that that God did step in and create out of nothing, and and additionally he destroyed the earth in a global flood, and uh, 
um, that uh, that those features are are evident in this creation and shape a great deal of the world as we know it. And uh, so you have um, Whitcomb and Morris uh, wrote a book called The Genesis Flood that really shaped a great deal of this thinking for uh, for many people. And so we'll uh, we'll look in at that in a little bit more, but. Uh, you get uh, also the rise of, of what you call the intelligent design movement. And a lot of this was cemented upon work from Philip and Denton, uh, really uh, stepping out and saying, you know, evolution by natural selection, this neo-Darwinian thinking doesn't explain the world that we see. But not really, again, offering an alternative. But then you get uh, the intelligent design moving movement really born from this type of thinking and saying, okay, well, how do we explain um, how do we emphasize the design within life and then use physical evidence to argue for the presence of a designer? So as we transition from uh, science, it's science in its historical context to science in its philosophical context, I want to talk a little bit about what was born out of uh, the the rise of the scientific method. So we, we talked in our last lecture about Sir Francis Bacon and uh, his position on the scientific method. Out of that comes the idea of what's called positivism. And there are two big parts of positivism. One is that we need to see where the boundaries of science are, uh, what science can speak to, and then what it can't speak to and realize so that we can basically mark a line and say, this is actual truth and anything that science can't speak to is not actual truth. Because if, if we can't identify it or know it because of what we can see, touch, hear, smell, or taste, then it isn't real. It's not truth. And also, an idea of positivism was basically, how do we prove theories to be true? And so the idea here is science is, is a house, a well-built house on an incredibly solid foundation that any scientific theory uh, can be proved to be true uh, and therefore rests on a very firm foundation and, and is, is essentially untouchable. Karl Popper, we've mentioned his name before uh, when we were talking about Sir Francis Bacon in the last lecture. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon said that we need to eliminate the bias of science by basically clearing your mind before every scientific inquiry. And Karl Popper says, you know, that's absurd. You can't do that. And instead, we're going to eliminate the bias by having uh, science be critiqued by your peers. Um, but he really spoke to this idea of positivism. And he said, you know, the, an example that he used was, you know, you could say your theory could be crows are black. And you may find a thousand black crows, or you may find a million, or ten million, or a hundred million black crows. But all it takes is for you to find one white crow, and now you've proven your theory false. And so, what he suggested, and what is far more reasonable, is that theories can't be proven true. And so rather than science being this idea of a very well-built house on an incredibly firm foundation, instead, science is more like a house built in a swamp with just enough underlying support that it holds the house up. And so science, our, our, our discoveries are tentative. He, he talked a lot about the tentative nature of science, and we talked about that last time as well. Um, but I think gives a, a far better understanding of the philosophy of science that even a well-established theory in, in many ways is like a, a house sitting on enough material in a swamp to keep it up above the level of the water and keep it from crumbling. But all it takes is pulling out a couple of those boards and that house will begin to crumble. Um, and again, that we can't prove theories true, we can, however, prove theories false and alternative theories false. So uh, another philosopher of science, uh, Thomas Kuhn, um, wrote, wrote a great deal about uh, the, the philosophy of science in, in the area of scientific revolutions. And um, he argued that basically along the lines of Karl Popper, 
uh, that that theories, even the most well entrenched theories, are still tentative because there could be some evidence that you would find uh, that would show them wrong. And what he suggested is that when we actually can demonstrate that a well entrenched theory is wrong that that's when you actually have a great deal of scientific progress. And he called these revolutions. And uh, he suggested that what actually causes a scientific revolution is not the accumulation of a great deal of data in support of well-entrenched theories and just more and more studies, but it really comes from a, a change in paradigm. And so he used this word, uh, paradigm a lot. Sorry, I don't know why conformers uh, came in late. Uh, use this idea of a paradigm a lot, but that scientists tend to be conformers. And so here's an image of everybody dressing the same at a sporting event. Uh, that that scientists tend to be conformers, and what that means is that they only ask certain questions based on their paradigm. That there's this well entrenched paradigm in which scientists operate under. And he's not saying that that conformers are in any way bad scientists. He, he would suggest, in fact, that in order for science to progress and in order for our understanding to progress and in order for, to even have a revolution, you need a great deal of conformers accumulating enough data that somebody can actually see that there might be something wrong with the paradigm. But he suggests that in order to have real scientific growth and in order to have uh, just these massive um, – you know, change in, in thinking that, that leads to some kind of a, a huge increase in our understanding of scientific knowledge, you, you need what are called mavericks. You need people that are willing to question the paradigm, that are willing to look at all of the data and say, hey, some of this might not match the paradigm, and, uh, and to start to think what you might call outside of the box. So here's a, uh, a very cool uh, rubber ducky, very much a, a maverick. And so he, Thomas Kuhn would suggest that both types of scientists are important, but that every generation needs a few mavericks to really question the paradigm and to fuel uh, this, this revolution that leads to a, a massive increase in our understanding of the natural world. And so uh, many philosophers of science suggest that right now we, we are poised uh, for one of these revolutions as we start to really question uh, the paradigm um, or as some start to question the paradigm. Again, most are not mavericks. Most are conformers of uh, evolution uh, by natural selection. Last thing I want to talk about in our area of thinking of how do we understand science in its context and specifically in its context of philosophy is uh, why are paradigms held onto so tightly? Why is it so hard for somebody to be a maverick, you know, and, and really question the paradigm and shift to a whole new paradigm. And um, you have some philosophers of science that suggest uh, that that what science is, is basically it's, it's made up of what you would call co competing research programs. And so uh, rather than – so every, every paradigm is in essence a, a competing research program or even a, just a piece of a paradigm. And at the very center of that research program is the, the well-entrenched theory that isn't really questioned. And then surrounding that in the same way that surrounding this individual here are a bunch of – balloons that are a little bit more fragile. So surrounding that well-entrenched theory, there are hypotheses that are far more fragile, that can be questioned, that can that people will legitimately put research projects together to try to prove them false if they are false. Um, but the, the problem is no matter how many of these balloons you break, you still have that well-entrenched theory uh, protected underneath. And so it takes a great deal of work in order to eliminate enough of these uh, protecting or peripheral hypotheses to actually get in to actually ask a question of that entrenched theory. And this is why paradigms can hold on so tightly because even if you can show, you know, dozens or hundreds of these peripheral hypotheses wrong, it's just there's so much protection on that entrenched theory that nobody's really questioning it. And it takes somebody who's really a maverick to come in and to start to ask uh, 
really big questions of that paradigm. And so as we as we think through this and as you prepare for our class, I, I just want you to really get into the habit of thinking about science, thinking about scientific inquiry, thinking about scientific progress in context of the history of science and in context of the philosophy of science.